Good evening, Demon Phil, Comics and More New Jersey here. And we're going to get started here in just a moment. Uh, just like we've done with the other shows, if you'll let me know, you can see and hear me on here. I'd appreciate it. And then we'll get going here shortly. Also, we need to share this thing out. Uh, get as many people here as we possibly can. We've been sharing from our ends over here as well. Uh, but we want to make sure and try to get as many people as possible. Scott, welcome to the show. Appreciate you being here. David, appreciate you being here. And as you come in, if you'll let me know you're here, so I'll know that you can see and hear me as well. And we will get started in about a minute or so. By the way, Scott, your um, your prize package on my end is going to be going out tomorrow. Uh, it was a little bit different because it was a larger size package because of the prints and everything. So I had to finagle some stuff together. Wendy, thank you for being here. All right, we're starting to get a few people in here now. Give it about another minute here to make sure we get this shared out and going. Russell, thank you for being here. Oh, no, Scott, thank you. That was a huge show, and I appreciate that, and you definitely deserve that. Everyone who won deserves. Everyone who was there deserves. Thank you very much for making that possible. All right, let me go ahead and remove the banner, and we're going to make this official. All right, Demon Phil, Comics and More New Jersey, and I've got another interview for you tonight. And tonight is actually very interesting. We've actually got, let me just go ahead and set this up real quick here. Um, we've actually got someone here that's a little bit out of my regular uh, uh, regular means of, of grabbing a hold of. I had a... a a colleague and a friend of mine that helped me to get him in here. And uh, for those of you that do know him, whenever you see him up here, you'll know what I'm talking about. For those of you that you don't, um, I deal more on the indie side. I've had more indie creators and everything here. Now, not only did I go over to the big two side with this particular guest, but he's actually way up there in the big twos. So, you know, if you're going to go, go big. Uh, and that's exactly what I did with this one. Now, that being said... Let me go ahead and start by thanking our sponsors, because that's what I need to do whenever we first get here. So first off, Sub-Zero Mission. Sub-Zero Mission, one of our sponsors here, everyone knows that is one of my personal, more important ones that I have, simply for the reason that they actually save lives by going out in their area and then giving out the necessary tools uh, to the uh, homeless vets out there to go ahead and survive the winters. So that's a big deal with me on that. If you don't know enough about that one, please reach out and you will find out more information on that. Totally Rad Comics. Totally Rad Comics has got Totally Rad Life Violet number three, which is in Kickstarter right now and Kickstartering some ass. So definitely go take a look at that one. Third Empire Banner. Third Empire Banner has got Mojo Rising will be coming out very soon. Should be coming out in the next week or two. Uh, definitely be looking for that one to get your mojo on. Codex Entertainment has got Lily the Demon S number four, which is coming out in four days on Kickstarter. So be looking for that one as well. 183 Degree Studios is Kara Nicole and Alfred Trujillo, which just finished up with Confessions of a Cosplay Diva, which is currently on Indiegogo or Crowdux. I can't remember which one. Um, but you can go ahead and grab a hold of that one if you did not get on the Kickstarter. So get that while it's still there. Comic Art Groupie, which is Wendy Steen Shaner, which has got Naughty Stripper Fairy Assassins number four, which is currently in Kickstarter. And well, it's it's blowing records left and right. So uh, she's doing a hell of a job on that one. And if you haven't jumped on that one, get on there, get number four, and go ahead and get one through three. You got to catch up on all this if you haven't already. And of course, our final sponsor, she is right up here in the corner where she always is. It is Pantsless Pizza. And if you don't know enough about Pantsless Pizza, stay tuned. More reveals showing up. All right. So that being said, without further ado. My guest tonight is none other than the inking legend himself, Scott Hanna. So we're going to bring him out here, ask him some questions, get to know him a little bit better. If you have questions in the audience, whatever, go ahead and get those ready as well, because here we go. Here is Scott. Hello. How are you, Phil? Hey, welcome to the show. Appreciate you being here. Yep. Good to be here, too. Hey, uh, so... For those that are out here that don't know who you are, I wanted to go ahead and give you a moment here. If you'll let them know who you are and where they can find you. 
Okay, uh, my name is Scott Hanna. I've been, uh, I'm a veteran comic book artist. I've been drawing for Marvel and DC Comics for well over 30 years, pretty much on every major top character for both companies, uh, mostly known for drawing long run on Batman and Detective Comics, especially during the Nightfall uh, saga. I was working on Spider-Man for uh, almost nonstop for about 15 years and I've done just about everything else. If they turn into a movie, I've probably drawn it. Um, you can find me um, <clears throat> on Facebook, on Instagram as hashtag Inker Scott, um, Facebook Scott Hanna or Scott Hanna Art. And I also teach art, uh, which you can find me at afiartschool.com. And I actually am now, because of the COVID shutdown, I'm actually doing online classes occasionally which are very interesting too. We're going to get into that because uh, I've actually looked into some of the stuff that you got on one of your other pages on there that we're going to bring up. But uh, so you've got an impressive resume is not a good enough word for this. So uh, like you said, you've pretty much touched a lot of things on there. So my first question has got to be, how did you get your start into the industry? What actually, you know, skyrocketed this thing the way that it is? Um, it's, it's actually a longer story than you would think. Um, I, when I was a kid, you know, growing up, uh, my mother's an artist, so I always loved art. Uh, and I started reading superhero comics specifically when I was about 10 years old, got really into it, loved drawing comics, but I never thought comics was a real job. I thought, you know, comics is something you can appreciate, but there's no way you're going to make a living at it, whatever. So then I went to New York City, went to art school. Uh, I went to Pratt Institute, which is still one of the top art schools in the country. And every one of my friends in art school loved comics too. So uh, actually uh, name dropping here, I went to school with uh, Mark Torello, George Pratt, John Van Fleet, uh, Keith uh, Williams, a whole bunch of us all did comic stuff. Um, but I still didn't think of it as a real job. I, I actually was going to school thinking I was going to be a book cover artist and do paintings. Um, and so I was kind of aiming that direction, but it really wasn't that well suited to me. So when I got out of school, I was finding difficulty kind of keeping or, you know, getting regular jobs. Illustration in uh, any form of art is difficult. Uh, I lived in New York City, so you could go from like publisher to publisher, but I wasn't really that socially adept yet. I was still you know, a shy, quiet artist type. I wasn't quite my teacher self that I am now. But some of my buddies who were already getting work in comics said, hey, Scott, we actually know an inker in comics that is looking for an assistant. Back in the old days, that was actually the way you got into the business. You either went and worked as, uh, you know, a Ramita's Raider at Marvel, or most often you went to work in an artist studio, learned from... Wally Wood or Neil Adams or uh, John Bissam or somebody would actually hire you. And a lot of inkers actually would have background inkers that the main inker would ink the main character and the background person would ink all the buildings and the minor characters, not get any credit whatsoever. Very little pay too. <laughs> but, but it was, it was your way to get into the business and, and get used to the differences between comics and other forms of illustration. Because when I went to college, they didn't teach us anything about comics. Actually, comics weren't even respected by most of my teachers. But we kind of transformed the school in the years we were there. But it, we still we were teaching them, not them teaching us, which is what you think teachers should do. Um, but anyway, so you learned on the job, and I learned it by working with another inker for a short while. And I learned I knew how to draw. I had already gone through four years of art school. I could draw very well, but I didn't know the specifics about comic book art as opposed to general illustration. I found out I actually loved it. I was actually quite good at it. Um, and uh, it, it, to find something that you love that you can actually get paid for is like the best thing you can happen in the world. Um, and so because I was working for this other uh, artist for a short while, he said, we lived in New York City, he said, hey, Scott, I'm doing a small convention in New York, and 
and back then conventions were nothing like the mega things they are now. They were, you know, people didn't have banners. You just went with a sketchbook, drew sketches, maybe charged five or 10 bucks, whatever. And you were happy as pie, right? So I went to, with this, um, the other artist to the show and it was such a small show. He basically said, hey, Scott, just take your own table. I'm like, cool. Okay. So I set up my table and I just started drawing. I put up a little hand drawn sign saying Scott Hanna, it's commissions. And people would come up to me during the short show and say, Hey, draw, you know, Storm from the X-Men. I'm like, sure, I can draw Storm. And I, you know, professionally, I'd never drawn any of these characters, but I grew up with all of them. So of course I knew how to draw Spider-Man and Superman and Batman and all that. So I spent the day drawing all these commissions and I was getting pretty regular customers because they could see the quality of my work. And I was super, super lucky because the table to my left was a small publisher. They were actually Eternity Comics, which was based out of New York City and they printed uh, independent black and white comics. And they watched me, they were watching me draw all day and said, man, you're really good. Would you like to work for us? I said, sure. <laughs> and that was actually how I got my job in comics. I, I didn't go to the company and, and pitch with a portfolio. I just did my thing. They noticed. They hired me right away. And the first thing, they, they gave me my own book to pencil and ink. And the, it's, it's kind of like learning how to swim by throwing you into the deep end of the pool. You know, you didn't, you didn't start out with a, a five page story. You started out with your whole book, 22 pages plus a cover. You got to get it done in a month. And that deadline is a lot tougher than most people think it is, especially if you're doing the penciling and the inking. And in this case, it was actually a black and white book. So I was doing gray tones as well. So I was, I was doing the grays, the inks, the pencils all by my lonesome first time ever doing a 22 page book. Um, by the end of the second issue, I was already having to draw like a war happening. And so you're drawing like, oh, there's, yeah, there's only a couple thousand people in this frame of the comic book. And like, ah, you know, you're pulling your hair out, but the script says you have to do it. So you have to do it. But anyway, this was, this was actually the best way to learn. And it's, it's still the best way to learn how to do comics is by doing comics. You know, if, if you think, oh, I only want to draw a little, you know, pretty butterflies, you're not going to be a comic book artist. You know, you, I, I tell people all the time that my job is to draw anything that the script tells me to draw. So the writer, anything in their imagination, if I don't know how to draw it yet, I got to figure it out real fast. Um, so doing it is the best way to figure those things out. And now we have the internet, we have all this other stuff, but learning how to just draw what you're told to draw is what illustration is all about. So anyway, while I was working for Eternity, I actually switched over from pencil or anchor to just anchor because penciling and inking a book a month is really, really tough. It's, it's a lot of work. And I found out that I, first of all, I actually had somebody else ink my work and I hated it. And I said, okay, I, I really want to have a say over with a printed product, what's actually going to be seen on the page. And I realized that by switching over to inking, I actually had complete control over the end product. You know, what, what the finished black plate of the book was going to be was my hand. And my drawing skill actually helped me be a better inker. And I was also much faster at inking than I was at penciling. So I realized, uh, I kind of did the math and said, hey, if I can ink two books a month and only, but only pencil one book a month, I actually make more money by inking two books a month. So I went to Marvel in DC after working for about a year at Eternity, doing both penciling and inking and straight up inking. I kind of, you know, I, I got all my practice. Then I went to Marvel in DC and applied for work as an inker. And they liked my samples, but they said, hey, here's samples of our pencilers to work on. And back then we didn't have blue line scans. We just had, you know, Xeroxes of the pencil work and you had to lightbox it. And I still to this day hate lightboxing. Lightboxing is horrible. I never do a good job lightboxing, but I had to do it to get a job at Marvel and DC. And weirdly enough, at Marvel, one of the, the pencilers they gave me to work on was John Romita Jr. And this was in his early days from his first run on Spider-Man. 
And when I inked his stuff, I just didn't get it. I was like, Man, I, I don't understand this style. It wasn't what I was used to. And because even though they gave me several other pencilers and I, I got to do John Bissama, I did, I forget who else I had, but a whole bunch of other, and I loved everybody else I did, but I hated the Ramita bench. And uh, DC also at the exact same, I got into both companies simultaneously. Uh, DC, they also gave me samples of their work, including Mike Mignola, um, a whole bunch of other people at that company. I liked all those. So I brought my stuff back to DC first, never brought my stuff back to Marvel because I was just ashamed of that one page. And I could have shown him everybody else except the one page, but I just, I didn't want to show him the Ramita Jr. page. And it's funny because I look back on that same page now, I'm like, it really wasn't that bad. I just, I just didn't get it. Um, anyway, so I, I got, I brought my work back to DC uh, and they immediately gave me work. And then immediately they started giving me not just one issue a, a month, but they started giving me two issues a month. So almost from the get go, I was working full time, doing what I love to do at DC Comics. And like one of one of my earliest books was Grant Morrison's Doom Patrol, which right now they've got it as a TV series and they're adapting stories that I worked on. And uh, so I got to start at, it, it wasn't quite Batman or Superman yet, uh, but I was starting with like great talent, you know, phenomenal writers. Even my letterer on Doom Patrol was John Workman. What, still, I consider him one of the all time best uh, letterers in all of comics history. And I got to work with him on one of my very first projects. Um, Richard Case uh, was the penciler in that book. He had also worked, uh, not with me, but he had worked at Eternity around the same time I had. And so we had that link in common. We didn't get to work together at Eternity, but we did at DC. So we really enjoyed like, you know, being kind of newcomers together on this really phenomenal project. So that's how I got into the business. Nice. Now, uh, Tom Hutchison's got a question here regarding that, which a lot of us are thinking too, is what was the Eternity book? Because that'd be your first work. <laughs> my, well, Technically, it's not my first work. I, I worked on a book, and I'm actually going blank on the name, but when I was in college, uh, Kent Williams self-published a book with all the, the comic talent at Pratt Institute, and it was only one issue. I did a, I wrote penciled and inked one-page story in that book. Um, I, I'm, I'm going blank on the name. Um, but anyway, that was technically my first published work. Even that wasn't technically my first because when I was in high school, I uh, was in an independent newspaper writing my own, doing my own comic strip. Uh, but my first book for Eternity, which I penciled, inked, and did gray tones was called Death Hunt. It lasted, I actually penciled two issues, but it got canceled after the first one. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it didn't last very long, but it was a great start to get into the, the industry. And I even look back at what I did and considering I was brand new at it, I did a decent job. I could, you could see my potential. I wasn't where I'm at now, obviously, but I, I had you know some of the right stuff. Now you had mentioned uh, briefly about uh getting a hold of something that you weren't sure how to deal with it. It kind of took you out of your wheelhouse. So my question on this would be, what are some of the most challenging pieces that you've had to work on that you've had to work out outside of your wheelhouse on that? Um, there are probably too many to count, but uh, a good example of that is when I started on Death Hunt, I actually, uh, I grew up loving like fantasy stuff. So Lord of the Rings, you know, King Arthur, Robin Hood, Conan, all that stuff was totally in my wheelhouse. And the first book they gave me, Death Hunt, was in this fantasy Lord of the Rings type realm. And there were dwarves and archers and swordsmen and magicians and uh, uh, like, you know, there's a lizard guy. I'm like, this is so cool. I love drawing this. This will be no problem. But they were being invaded by all these people from the future with high tech gear. And I really wasn't that comfortable with high tech gear. So I spent twice as long on the high tech stuff than I did at the stuff I already knew I could draw. And I got better at it. It wasn't great, but I was a lot better. And it looked at least equivalent that I wasn't just like taking total shortcuts. And so after Death Hunt got canceled, after I'd only been on it for two months, 
They're like, Scott, your high tech stuff is so good. We're going to give you an outer space book. I'm like, oh man. <laughs> and, and then on top of that, back then, I still wasn't quite as good at doing women as I was at doing men. Because you can look in the mirror and see what your body looks like, your face looks like. Um, but I wasn't quite as good from totally from my imagination of drawing women. So the second book they gave me was Outer Space Babes. So it was nothing but uh, <laughs> women in outer space. So my two weak points were outer space, high tech stuff and women. And by literally like my third month of the business, that's all I was getting to draw was that. <laughs> and but again, I worked on, I think, only two issues of Outer Space Babes by the end of two issues. I knew how to draw women. I knew how to draw outer space stuff. I was getting better all the time. And pretty much every time you get a script, that same thing happens. If there's something, it's like, oh man, I haven't drawn a tank in forever. You gotta go back and learn how to draw a tank. Um, if it's an undersea world, oh, I gotta do all my research on the fishes again. And you know, what do whales look like? And what kind of whale is in the story? Um, and so I, fortunately, I ever since I was a kid, I've studied animals. So like I know all, I, I even one of the classes I teach is animal anatomy because I think it's a good idea for artists to have a working knowledge of almost all animals. Um, you know, if you can't draw a person on a horse, you're not gonna tell the right story if that's a requirement in the story. Um, but the same thing happens if I'm having somebody flying a jet, I have to make that jet convincing. So, um, you know, it's one thing to, I, I because I still, I'm slightly weaker at the techie stuff. I have a lot of toys of cars and tanks and jets so that I can actually turn them in space and look at them. So if the Hulk is lifting a car over his head, I want to know what the undercarriage looks like really well. So I've got some really detailed models that help me do that. And we still have the internet now too. Absolutely. And let me see, Philip Rutherford has got a point up here that I want, this is actually right in time with what I'm going to ask you. So Scott is on record as having inked the most pages in uh, comic history or recorded history and won a ton of inking awards. And I've heard this as well. So we kind of discussed this prior to coming out here. But if you'll go ahead and talk about that just a little bit, because that's pretty impressive. Um, well, this is, this is one of those things that just weirdly happened. It's not a goal that I ever set to do the most pages. I... I do comics because I love doing comics. Um, I, I literally get paid to do a job I love. So my philosophy pretty much my whole life long was it's like, hey, these Marvel and DC are suckers enough to pay me for this stuff. I'm gonna do it as, as much as I can. I'm gonna just get to draw comics 12 hours a day, every day and love it. Now, some people get burned out really fast because the deadlines can be horrific. The pressure can be really, really heavy. But for me, it was just something I really love to do. I also have a very understanding artist wife who, if I had a normal wife, she would be driven insane by how much I work. <laughs> um, but since she's an artist too, she knows what it's like to get into the zone and all that stuff. So, uh, and I actually, one of the first uh, professionals I met when I got at DC was Dick Giordano, who I was totally blown away that he was working at the time as an editor at DC and he still was inking um, books on the side. And he told me one time, I was like, oh yeah, I ink two pages before I come to work. I'm like, what the heck? How, how is that even humanly possible? Because for me at that time, two pages was like a 10 hour day. And he would do that in the morning before his full-time job. But that kind of opened my eyes to the possibility that it, you know, it actually, it maybe can. And I didn't know at the time he also had assistants that were helping him out with backgrounds. And, and I was trying to do this all by myself most of the time. But anyway, I just, you know, w once I started getting into the industry, I just, I focus intently. I, I tell people, don't try to be me because I'm insane. I just draw all the time. Uh, but that adds up after, you know, five years, it's a lot of pages after 10 years, it's a lot more, but, and I actually, my fans started bringing it to my attention that there were some websites out there that were kind of listing all the stuff that I'd done. And I wasn't keeping, I, I had a general idea, but I've never kept exact count. So that, that's why it's debatable whether I'm the most or not, because it's not, I haven't recorded every single page. I could probably do that, but it would take me forever. Um, so maybe when I retire, I'll start like yeah, actually coming up with the exact count. But my my rough estimate is I've done 
probably between 22 and 23,000 pages of comic book art. Um, now, there's one website that had me listed at being close to 20,000 pages, but they were missing most of the last five years of my Marvel stuff, for instance. So I know they were missing a lot of my work. On that same website, Vinnie Coletta was listed at having done something like 21,000 pages, and he was generally considered to always be the uh, most prolific inker in the industry. Uh, and not just Inker, uh, actually the most prolific artist. He, he beat out Jack Kirby. He beat out John Buscema. Um, but anyway, uh, so I think I've done more than Vinny did, at least according to that 21,000 number. But if that same site was off by me by several thousand, they could be off with Vinny by several thousand. And we don't know. And back in the early days, they didn't even get credit all the time. And I know, for instance, even I have done books where I didn't get credit. I've even done books where I got credit that I didn't even work on the book. So it's that's why I say it's iffy, but absolutely I'm supposed to have done more than anybody else alive. Um, according to my numbers, I've done more than even Vinnie Coletta has, and I don't erase my penciler's work. <laughs> so, Vinnie was considered one of the biggest hacks of all time. I don't know if you know the stories, but... <laughs> Now, we had kind of discussed backstage, and I wanted to bring this up. Is um, you have your your show, the uh, your uh, that you do on the Facebook. Uh, in fact, I have that. Let me bring it up real quick because I actually have the link. So that's actually on the feeds as well. So you can click directly in there if you wanted to. Excellent. But uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I've watched a few of your shows, and I think you still have the piece right next to you that you did this evening uh, of Nova. Yes, uh, actually, we're, that's right here. Well, you'll share if that you room. can. So, I, I, this is actually 18 by 24, much larger than my normal uh, comic book uh, convention sketches. But because I was doing it for the live stream, I like to draw large. The camera can see it easily, and the fans can see what I'm doing. So, when I came into the live stream, whenever it started, I got in there, you were inking, I mean, it was pencils, but the inking you were doing the hand and you were doing the right hand, the right arm. And that was pretty much almost completed. I turned away, did some packing, moving around some stuff around here. And then like most of the torso, the legs, all this was done. And I'm looking at it going, how much time has passed? <laughs> when I talked about that is how fast you're able to do that. But it's actually really cool because you explain it as you go along as well. Right, and that, that's part of my teaching. Uh, I've actually been, uh, I co-created with my wife, artsandfashioninstitute.com, and I've been teaching uh, regularly since then. And when you teach, you have to explain what's going on. I know as an artist, I love demonstrating when I teach, so I actually draw in front of my students, but at the same time, I talk about what I'm doing. If I just, if you just lecture during art classes, you don't artists don't learn as much. If you just draw in front of classes, they still don't learn as much. If you draw and teach or talk, they, I, I think it gets into their brain in a much, much better way. That's how I learn better, so that's how I like to communicate with my students. And so it's just become very natural for me to talk about, I, when I'm at home by myself, I'm not talking to anybody for weeks except for my wife. Um, but when I'm teaching, I can just talk nonstop because I want them to get, I want it to get into their head. I want them to understand what I'm doing. And I'm, as I mentioned to you earlier that it's weird that until I started teaching, I didn't realize that how much I thought about everything I did that I, I am quick, I'm fast at what I do, but I do it with intent, I do it with purpose, with a reason behind what I'm doing. So I'm not just scribbling and, and testing and working. I, yeah, I'm doing that, but I'm doing it quickly and I'm doing it for, with reasons. And after you've been drawing like I have for, you know, professionally in comics, I've been doing it for about 33 years, but I've been drawing Seriously, I, I literally, when I was 10 years old, I knew I was going to be an artist. So I focused on art for that whole time period. And you get to the point where you trust yourself. You know that your, your instincts are right. You've learned all the right lessons. So doing it, at least for me, is very fun and easy. It's actually not. And the other thing, one of the reasons I'm quick is because I'm actually not that scared of screwing up. Um, and not all artists can say that. Actually, most artists can't say that. Um, 
But I, I realized early on that art is about screwing up, that if you make it, you know, we're not there to be perfect. If you want to be perfect, you know, take out a camera and take a snapshot. Even that's not perfect either, but it's what people think is perfect. And I could do a, an image and make it look exactly like a photograph, but what's the point? I could just use the photograph. So art is about changing it, about doing things and manipulating and playing and, and trying things. And you can't try new things unless you're willing to screw up. So the more you're willing to screw up, the more you learn and the more stuff gets in your head and you do better the next time. So my philosophy as a teacher and as an artist is don't go forever backward and try to fix your old mistakes. Try to learn from your old mistakes and make new mistakes and you know learn from the old things get better but then keep trying to make new stuff and make new mistakes so you can keep on learning uh, to me art is one of those things that you never ever stop learning uh you you i want to i want to be drawing until i die literally you know the day before i die i want to be still drawing that's what i want to do and that means i still want to be getting trying to get better until the day i die um, it's not just about drawing what you know automatically. It's like, hey, test yourself, try to get better. Now, I've got someone in the audience over here. I've been talking to her for a while. She's a, uh, a new artist who just got out of school and everything, and she's really wanting to make this her profession, and she wanted to put a question up here. When you were starting in the comic career, were you nervous? Uh, she just graduated from re uh, revising her comic first comic uh, graphic novel. It was a uh, senior thesis and I'm reworking it. So as an amateur, I'm very nervous, especially getting a job. So she's asking if you were nervous in this and how you kind of overcame that. Um, yeah, we're, you're always nervous whenever, literally for the first several years, I think, of doing comics. I was like, do I know what I'm doing? I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, Like I said, I didn't even have professors that were teaching me how to do this. I kind of learned it on the job. So when that happens, you, there's, there's no better way to stop being nervous than just to get it done. Um, now, for me, I'm personally extremely deadline driven. So when I got my first project, like at Eternity Comics, they said I had to do 22 pages in a month, which is, even for most professionals, that's an insane deadline. <laughs> um, so, but you try to do it anyway. You get it done to the best of your ability within that time frame. If you're working, like the fact that you're working on a graphic novel, that means you're doing way more than just 22 pages. That's a gigantic, and most people have never done 100 pages of anything in their life, and now they're trying to do a 100-page graphic novel story. That's totally insane. That's really, really hard to do. So the fact that you even did one already or doing one for your thesis, that means you're well ahead of the curve. So you don't need to be nervous. Now, we're always self-conscious and we're always trying to get better. And this goes back to what I just said before that, yeah, we're going to screw up. We're going to do things badly. The goal is hopefully if you're doing it like a, say, 80 page graphic novel, you're going to actually see physical evidence that you get better over the course of time, that you're going to figure out, wow, this works, that didn't work. doesn't mean go back and redraw every page you screwed up. It means you're going to be a better artist by the end of that story. And then the next story you do, you're going to be even better. And then the next story you do, you're going to be even better. Um, I'm good friends with uh, Walter Simonson. I grew up um, reading his early Manhunter stuff. I liked it. Um, but the stuff he's doing now, I think, is 10 times better. He's doing just this insane amount of, like, rendering and detail, and his storytelling has just gotten so phenomenal. Not that it was ever bad, but he got better over the course of time. We all do. That's how art works. You can't, you can't expect to start out being a master. Art takes time. So the only way to get over that nervousness, to get better at your craft, is to put in the the – the the endless hours um i i don't somebody i'm horrible with numbers so never count my numbers but um people usually say it takes like a thousand something odd hours to get good at what you're doing in art i've been drawing almost 12 hours a day for 33 years i'm still trying to get better okay and if you count up that, that number of hours that's an insane amount of hours and i'm still trying to get better now, we've got a couple of questions over here that I want to go ahead and bring up. So Philip Rustard has got, it's a two-part question. Was it difficult to learn light source and line weight? Um, 
Weirdly enough, uh, okay, light source I actually learned really early because my mother is a fine art painter. And when I was, actually when I was 10, I was begging to get into her oil painting class because I she was a phenomenal artist. I wanted to learn from her. Um, she actually had a cutoff of 13 year olds only and up, which is actually generally the age I teach at because kids are generally a little bit more mature and can settle down and whatnot. Um, but I bugged her for a year, and by the time I was 11, she let me into her class. And I was I was painting to a, a young 11-year-old boy who read comic books. I was having to paint flowers and still lives, right? Which was kind of very boring for me, but what it taught me, the first thing she taught me was that all good painting starts with good drawing. All good drawing starts with understanding values. Understanding values means you have to understand light source. So I learned those fundamentals of really good drawing skills at a really early age, and that has uh, has maintained throughout my entire life. So nothing that I learned then was wrong. So I learned all the right stuff early, and I kept at it. So I kept getting better and better and better. But I like when I'm teaching, I usually teach my students to start out with one basic light source. When I draw, I, I was doing one of my live streams last week. I think I was throwing in at least three different light sources. Actually, it was more like four different light sources. And I was just winging it. I was doing it. I hadn't planned it out ahead of time. I'm just, okay, I, I, I'm going to throw it in. And now I know enough how to do that because of my years of experience. But again, it takes practice. But learning light sources is a fundamental thing that's good for all art that is really, really, really important to learn as early as you can get to it. Now, the second part of that question was the line weights. Line weights are something that's very, very particular to an inker. Inking is different than a lot of other media. It's, it's entirely based on black lines on white paper. And so you have to create a different kind of illusion of lighting and light source than you do than if you're doing painting. So even penciling, you can shade a lot. With inking, you have to shade by doing cross hatching or parallel lines or solid blacks or white on black or all these kind of tricks. And one of the first things I started paying attention to when I started picking up inking. Now, I had a really good high school teacher where he introduced me to pen and ink when I was a senior in high school. And I kind of played with it all through my four years of college, but I never had anybody teach me inking. Um, and then I worked for a short time, for about six months with an inker who kind of taught me some of the specifics, but even some of the stuff he taught me, I didn't like. I actually didn't learn, I, I learned as much stuff not to do from that guy as I did what to do, at least from my perspective. Um, but what I immediately tried to do as an inker when I was playing with the tool of, of ink and quill pens and brushes is I went, I went back to my childhood of how do you show off light sources. And one of the things I realized very quickly was that if you flex the line from thick to thin, especially in an outline, that shows where a form is being lit. So if you draw a circle and you do a flat line around a circle, it looks like a circle. If you draw if you draw a shadow underneath it, it looks like a ball. But if you actually make the line very thin at the light source side and then much thicker as it goes to the shadow side and then thin again and even stop it before it meets the other line, just by that outline line weight change, you've actually turned it into a round object. Then if you go ahead and shade inside the object using thick and thins, it gets even more form. So the more you use thick and thins in inking, the more dimensional your artwork becomes. And in my mind, doing inking is all about creating that illusion of form. It doesn't have to be. Uh, actually, I've got, hold on a second. So this is actually, um, okay, if you can see it without the shine. Okay, this is actually a sample piece I did. It's in glass, so it's hard to see. Hold on. Okay, there we go. And I actually did this with a different kind of inking technique where I wasn't doing a lot of thick and thins like I normally do. I was doing more bold, simple lines. So this is another way you can ink, but I still, my favorite way is actually use brush and ink because brushes are really flexible in creating that uh, thin to th thick line with just like the barest amount of pressure of your hand, 
you can get this really amazing variation. And so my favorite tool in inking is always the brush. Uh, brush is also faster. <laughs> um, main reason the brush is faster is because it holds more ink, so you can keep doing it without dipping it over and over again. And also uh, it dries faster. If you use a quill pen, which I, I love doing quill pens and I use them all the time, but quill pens take longer to dry. You can smear them easily, so you have to be very careful about the artwork. Um, so brush, if you can handle a brush, it's a super sensitive tool. So you have to have a really light touch. You have to be like in total control of your pressure. But if you have that, it's an amazing tool. And again, that goes with uh, watching some of your shows that you've done, watching you ink these things. And as fast as you are to go ahead and give that much depth to the picture and everything by doing it the right way. And like you said, you know exactly how much pressure to put on there because you've done it through all the practice. Exactly. Yeah. And that's why we can't, you know, it's not like somebody that wants to start inking can go ahead and say, oh, I'm going to go ahead and do just that thing right now. <laughs> they need yeah. to do it in practice. Uh, a good, I, I liken uh, the kind of art I do a lot to music. Like my brother actually was a guitar player and he had to get blisters and practice, you know, his chords for hours and hours and hours. And he started out lousy and he actually got to be really good, but it took hours and hours and hours and hours of practice. And art is that way. You can't just pick up a tool and expect to be an expert at it to get go. Um, you you have to put in the time. And and a lot of people don't want that time to be necessary. They think, oh, it can be magically be perfect at the get-go. No, it can't. Um, uh, unfortunately, because I've been doing art so long, it is now much, much easier for me to adapt to different tools. So the same thing happens with musicians. Like It takes you years to get good at one instrument, but once you've mastered one instrument, the next instrument is much, much easier. And then the next instrument after that is much easier. So there are some people that can play 20 different instruments, but they can't start out playing 20. They have to start out with one and then get... So my mother, one of the media she's really good at is she's a grandmaster pastel artist. And you have to win like... I, I forget this this enormous number of first prize awards and pastel jury pastel shows. She got that and she is phenomenal at pastels. And pastels are not something I was ever used to. I didn't really practice pastels. I didn't even understand them. So a couple of years ago, my mother was visiting and said, Mom, can we just do a pastel still life together? Go back to my 11 year old self, take a class with my mom. And I sat next to her. We both, both took out pastels. I saw how she was doing it. I was doing it. And in an hour or so, I did a really nice pastel drawing or painting. And I got it because I'm so adept with just art. The, the new medium, I learned the specific tricks of, oh, how do you layer that medium? How does this medium work? Once I got that from that point on, it's like, oh, I get it now. But that that's not the one hour of learning I did. It's the one hour plus 40 years of learning I did to get to that one hour. Now, what have been some of your personal favorite of the things that you've done? I mean, I know a lot of times artists are more critical of their work than anything else, but you've got to have some kind of personal favorite that you're like, wow, that was just that that's my pinnacle right there. Well, um, growing up as a kid, my two favorite characters were by far Batman and Spider-Man. Uh, so I, I, I love group books because when I was a kid, I can only afford like one book a month. So I'm like, oh, I'll get the Justice League or the Avengers because there's a whole bunch of characters in here. But when I started being able to buy more than one comic book or when I started, I, I would get kind of runs on a character. And I had a long run on Batman. I had a long run on Spider-Man. I had a super long run on the X-Men. Um, but at an early age, I really gravitated toward those two characters for different reasons. They're very different, and, but they're similar in some ways. Um, and so in my career, I've had very iconic runs on both characters. Um, probably the most nervous I've ever been in professional comics was not my first job working at Eternity. It was actually my first time doing uh, Batman and Detective Comics. And I was doing what were called finishes, where I got rough pencils from my penciler, Tom Lyle. I was finishing the pencils and inking it. And I was doing this on Batman. And the pressure, the internal pressure of, 
I'm working. I'm working on Bat. Batman has been around since you know forever, and he's this like just the my favorite character, and I've got to draw him now and make it look as good as I possibly can because it's Batman. Um, so so the amount of pressure and that was just phenomenal. And then that started literally like five years on Detective Comics, where uh, I, actually I worked on pretty much every Bat book over those five years. But that went into the whole Nightfall storyline, which even at the time we were doing Nightfall, the breaking of the bat, all that stuff, we kind of had an idea that this was a big deal. Um, you know, it was cro- the storyline was crossing over between all four of the main bat titles, plus Robin had his own book, Catwoman even had her own book. Um, like I said, during that period, I worked on every single title, at least, you know, a couple of times. Um, but... I'm still to this day, I am so proud of that whole story, what we accomplished, the team effort of all these talent from, you know, uh, the, the writers were from totally different pet spectrums. It, it would be like, um, you know, just, I mean, total opposites working on the same character, trying to fit the story together and make it work. And we made it work, you know, somehow all this. And I, I actually really credit Denny O'Neill was the group editor on the Bat books. And he was such an accomplished writer himself. He knew how to bring us all together. I would go to these Bat summits where I would be able to throw out my ideas just as much as everybody else's. Um, so they, it was really like a family team environment. We all work great together. Um, and I'm, I'm just, I'm still so pleased with what we accomplished at that time. So to me, working on, especially Nightfall is one of the, by far the highlights in my career. And then I, um, actually right after Nightfall, I started working on Spider-Man and that was the next most nervous time I was ever in my career of, <laughs> Wait, now I'm a Spider-Man. And and it wasn't my first book for Marvel. Actually, I think a couple of years previous, I had done like one issue of Wolverine. So yeah, I really had to start low on the on, on Marvel. Um but but my but really Spider-Man was what my first major project at Marvel, and it was my first ongoing project at Marvel. I was doing more than one issue. Um so the pressure again was really high. The self-imposed pressure was really high. Yeah, for my editors, so I, I'd even worked with Tom Lyle was the same penciler who got me onto Detective Comics. So it was my buddy, um, new writer, but I was getting used to him really quick. Um, brand new editor who had no idea who I was. Uh, so he, I had to kind of impress a little bit, but the pressure internally was really, really severe. Because um, again, I'm on my childhood character. I, yeah, I pulled off Batman, but Spider Man was this totally different monster, and we had to, you know different look, different feel. Um, and that again, I, I somehow I managed to make it work, and I stayed on that character for a 15 year run. Um, uh, not always the same book. I think I started on an adjective list Spider Man, so just the plain Spider Man title. Then I went on to do Sensational Spider Man. Uh, um, eventually I got all the way up to Amazing Spider-Man, which I had a very long run on that. And that leads me to what I consider to be kind of my most important issue was Amazing Spider-Man number 36. Um, and that was dealing with 9-11, the fall of the World Trade Center. And because Marvel is based in New York City, most of the freelancers actually at least started living in New York City if they didn't still live in New York City. So as I said, I was a New Yorker for a long time. I still consider it to be, once you're a New Yorker, you're always a New Yorker. You know, uh, it never really leaves you. Right now I live in Pennsylvania, but I'm still kind of a New Yorker at heart. Um, so when 9-11 happened, it was this devastating, super personal thing to not just me, but everybody who, I, I mean, everybody in the U.S., but everybody who lived in New York, especially, it was our backyard it was our family it was our world was was attacked and we all felt so helpless and when we we got i i was very fortunate i got to work marvel put out three different projects they put out the book heroes about 9 11 they put out a moment of silence about 9 11 and they put out amazing spider-man 36 and when 
when we we got the script from J. Michael Straczynski, uh, which he apparently uh, I I saw him recently, and he wrote it in like a couple of days. Uh, it was it was insane. Now it is easier for a writer to write something in a couple of days than for than for an artist to write. But we we were trying to get this out as soon as possible because it was a very 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 current real life event. So I think from the writing to the finished coloring, we got the whole project done in like a month. And if you look at the art in there, it's insanely detailed. We were doing real research on uh, John Romita Jr. just was killing himself because, again, he's a New Yorker. Uh, he, I think he was born in New York. He lived in New York most of his life. So it was very personal to him. Uh, it was very visceral. You know, we were crying when we were doing this stuff because it was so real. Um, and the fact that we tied in this fictional Spider-Man universe into a real-life event and it was gut wrenchingly honest. You know, it was we Spider Man was helpless too because he wasn't there to save everybody, just like we weren't there. So the fact that in my small skill set of being able to draw comics was able to work on this amazing statement about a real life situation and have it get out there into the world. And then um, a while later, we actually, my sister-in-law was actually doing counseling at Ground Zero for the workers working at the site. And for those workers, it was very difficult because they were digging up body parts and then having, and being the typical, you know, He-Man worker, they would go home and not share it with their family or not know how to deal with it. So they started having marital troubles or personal troubles or family, you know, and so they were bringing in counselors to help these people deal with it. And they were having a really, really hard time getting through the barriers, which is normal. So my sister-in-law, when she got called in, she said, Scott, didn't you work on some like comic book stuff? And I'm like, yes, I did. She said, could you send some of those to Ground Zero? So I gathered up, I think I even called Marvel, but I said, hey, can I get extra copies of Heroes and Moments of Silence, Amazing Spider-Man 36 and get them to the tent at Ground Zero for the workers at the site to look through this stuff? So the cops, the firefighters, the construction work, the engineer, everybody was there. They had access to this stuff. And my sister-in-law said it worked. It actually got them to serve. They would start reading in the tents, you know, take a break, reading through the comic books. Like, I think in uh, Among Us, Silence and Heroes, we were drawing real people you know, that, and real events. And they were like, man, I knew this guy at this fire department and it was, it was no longer with us. And so, then, and so by me being able to draw comic books and have it help the people on the site was to me the most important thing I've ever done in my life. The fact that I was able in that, my small little world way to help those people, I, I think is, is just so special about what I've been able to do in my career. That That is great because yeah, I mean, anything would have helped. And I think a lot of people thought that because they could, you know, out millions of dollars to help out people, they just thought they had no power. And all they really needed was just smiles and people talking to each other and communication and just positivity. Yeah. Uh, and, and once it started getting the morale building up off of that, you could see the morale shift whenever that happened. So you being a part of that with the books and everything, I, I can only imagine how much you would see that morale shift almost immediately whenever they got those books. Well, I, I even I really appreciated when they did uh, the first Sam Raimi directed the first Spider-Man movie. Uh, they kind of had that attitude in the film that the New Yorkers got together and were cheering on. And but it wasn't just Spider-Man; it was the the whole society working together. So that very much reflected what we were doing in the books. Very cool. Uh, now, my next question is. We've kind of we've we've talked a lot about some of the people you've worked with in the past and everything, and you worked with a lot of people and all. So my question would be, who have you not worked with that you would like to? Uh, well, there were several people that I didn't get a chance to work with early in my career that are no longer with us. So um, I I've been actually extremely fortunate. I worked with a lot of my childhood idols. You know, I as a kid reading comic books, I would you know. Uh, read this stuff or, or uh, be influenced by artists. And then later on in my career, I got to work with those pencilers and work with those writers and become friends with them and co-workers with them, which was just mind blowing that I got to work with all these people. 
Um, but there, there were unfortunately a couple that I never got a chance to work with. Like John Basema, I never got a chance to work with him. He was one of my, you know, really strong influences. I did get to work with others like Neil Adams and Mike Rell, Sal Basema I got to work with, Nick Cardi. I even, I, I, the first comic book I remember getting was an issue of Justice League of America. Nick Cardi did the cover and uh, shortly before I passed away, I got to work with Nick and in ink over his work, which was a, a dream come true kind of thing. Um, so that's happened to me over and over again. I've gotten to work with some of the very best artists in the entire industry, uh, most of most all of the best writers in the industry. Um, new ones keep popping up though. So, you know, there's still new people that come in. It's like, wow, that, you know, that's such great writing. I want to work with this guy or that, that new artist. That's such a cool take on the character. I want to work with them. Uh, so there's always room to, you know, expand and, and get new influence. And that's one of the things I love about my job is by working with new artists or working with new writers, that stretches me even further, that pushes me further, that gets me out of my comfort zone and says, hey, try a different direction, try something new. Um, but some of the, I, I didn't get a chance to work with a lot of the early image guys. So like I've never professionally worked with Jim Lee because I was never an image artist. Um, I have worked with a couple, never got to work with Todd McFarlane, uh, though I love his work. Um, so those are two of the big guys that I have not yet worked with. I did do, one piece over Jim Lee for the Inkwell Awards. Uh, it was actually a Superman cover from New 52, which I, I loved it. I had actually a great time doing it. I think I, I was actually extraordinarily flattered because somebody said, oh, this is better than the original cover that was printed, which was actually inked by Scott Williams, who is a phenomenal artist. Uh, so there's no way I want to, you know, try to do tit for tat against somebody like Scott, but um, I, I envy him that he's gotten to work with Jim for so many years, but he makes Jim look really good. So there's a reason. I Actually, when I was first starting out, I met Jim Lee, and at that time, I think he was doing The Punisher, which was the first time he teamed up with Scott Williams. And I told Jim, and this was before I gotten into the big, you know, characters. I told Jim, it's like, stay with this Scott Williams. He's so good with you. <laughs> that team was just so excellent. Um, but anyway, there, there's still a few modern artists that I, I hope at some point I get to work with or I get to work with them again. Like there's some artists, I won't mention any names, but I worked with them early in their career and now they're much better and I'm much better. And I'd rather, I'd like to work with them again where we're both at this another, uh, another higher level than where we were like 25, 30 years ago. Now we've got a couple of questions over here from Allison Warren. So bouncing off that question, do you think any younger or newer artists would want to work with you sort of a dream come true thing? Um, I'm actually very flattered. I get uh, contacted even on Facebook, Instagram by artists who are just getting started in the industry. I actually love working with new artists. I'm kind of the, because I'm a natural teacher, I'm, I'm a coach. I can, I can smooth out their stuff. If they're willing to listen, some new artists are very super sensitive and they don't want any feedback. But I found out, at least through the course of my career, that usually the artists that are willing to take criticism are the ones that get better faster. And they actually come, they go on to become the greats. And I've worked with some that started out okay and became phenomenal, but it's because I would give them a piece of advice and they, they wouldn't say, oh, he's just critiquing me. I don't want to listen to that. They said, hey, this guy knows what he's talking about. Maybe I can learn from him. They paid attention and they got better. So most of the new artists know who I am. They know I know what I'm talking about. And so I have a, I've had a lot of new artists ask for me that want to work with me. I also have had a lot of editors that assign me to new artists because they know I can help the newcomers. I can, yes, I can make the pros look as good as the pros look. That's my job. But my job is to make the beginners look as good as their as their potential is. I want to make them look even better than they can look by themselves. And a lot of nowadays, especially with digital inking, a lot of people think, oh, I can do it all myself, but they don't realize what they're missing because they haven't just specialized in inking. They don't, they don't know 
wow, ink can do that. Ink can add all these textures or ink can add all this depth and dimension or add these light sources that they weren't aware of because they never worked as a partner. And a lot of times, if you do it all yourself, you magnify your own flaws. You actually make everything you do badly, especially if you ink yourself, you make all your mistakes worse. It's horrible. I, now, it doesn't last forever. I mean, you go through a learning curve like anything else. But working with a partner and getting a different perspective gives you a different outlook, which makes you better faster, at least in my experience. So, yeah, I love working with new artists, and a lot of new artists love working with me. That's what they've told me. The second question that Allison had is right here. Uh, also, sorry for asking so many questions. <laughs> what do you think I should work on as a new artist? And what jobs do you think I should apply to uh, to get my foot in the door? Okay, well, one of the things I stress for all of my students, uh, especially if you want to be in the kind of illustration that I do is sequential storytelling or, or sequential art that includes movies. So storyboards for film, animation, video games, comic books, any of those things require really, really strong focus in telling a story with your picture. So the fact that you're working on a graphic novel is amazing because you're telling a story. Um, as I said, when I started out, I thought I was going to be a book cover illustrator where you have to tell uh, quite a bit of story with one single image. So doing a cover is, do, is very, very different than telling a whole story. The better you are at telling a story, the better it will make you as an artist because you have to put on so many different hats. You have to become the lighting director, the acting director. You have to, you know, you have to stage things. You have to edit things. You have to uh, just do panel formats. You have to do all these different stages that but it's necessary and it makes you a better artist. So I always tell everybody, yeah, you have to learn how to draw but you really, really have to learn how to tell a story with your drawings. So my favorite class to teach is my sequential art class where I will reference not just comic books, I'll reference movie storytelling, uh, animation, um, all kind of TV shows, all kinds of things to make yourself a better storyteller because drawing is just the first step. Telling the story is the more expansive, bigger step. Now, let me see. We got uh, Russell Allen is in here asking. I was waiting for it. I knew it was coming. Have you ever done a Vampirella piece? I, um, the vast majority of my career, I've worked almost exclusively for Marvel and DC Comics because they do not publish Vampirella. I have never had any published Vampirella work. I have been commissioned to do Vampirella pieces at conventions. So if you come up to me at a show, I will do whoever you ask me to do. I actually... I, when I was a kid, I was reading the, you know, the black and white Vampirella magazines because the art was just stunning. Um, and especially as an inker, if you want to learn inking, go back and study some of that, the, the black and white line work in Vampirella. So I've, I've loved the character for as long as I can remember. And I love getting to draw her when I get commissions, but I've never had a published Vampirella piece yet. I know I always say yet because there's always potential for the future. If they called me up tomorrow and said, Hey Scott, would you like to do something in Memorial? I'm like, sure, yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. As long as I have the time in my schedule. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Now, uh, I ask this of a lot of my my guests, and it's it's kind of odd asking you because most of the time their answer is your name is in there somewhere. So I'm kind of going backwards on this one, but I want to ask you. Who, who is it that, that has influenced you the most in what you do? Um, that's a really good question. Um, in art, I was actually influenced much more by turn of the century, golden age illustration and an ink artists uh, like uh, Joseph Clement Cole and uh, Heinrich Clay, uh, Franklin Booth. Uh, most people don't know that uh, Bernie Wrightson, who did his spectacular Frankenstein work, was basically channeling Franklin Booth. So I learned from actually the same people that Bernie learned from. I learned from all these amazing people that, you know, are no longer with us. They they were stopped working well before I got into art, but I grew up with their work, and that's been one of my strongest influences. Um, I think, as I mentioned earlier, Dick Giordano, when I first met him, he was um, 
he wasn't ever a teacher of mine, but he was an early encourager. Actually, I ran into him in the hall and my editor showed him one of my Doc Savage pages and he gave me a quick critique in the hallway. And I was just like, you know, being crushed because Dick Giordano was telling me I was doing something wrong. But at the same time, it was teaching me stuff and I was learning like right on the spot. And he later became just a friend. And again, he led by example. So it was like, wow, Dick could do this, maybe I can do this too. So it became not impossible for me to ink three books a month or four books a month or five books a month, which I have done on rare occasions. Um, but just the fact that he showed it could be done meant that, oh, maybe I can pull this off. And uh, so, and he was also a really nice guy, a really good encourager. And I love the fact that we got to be friends and, you know, coworker, even after he retired, he would call me up occasionally and just want to chat and stuff. And the fact that that happened to me is just amazing. Uh, but, but I'm going to go back to Allison. She mentioned something about the college professors. And I, I jokingly tell my students, but not really jokingly, because it's kind of serious in that I wish I had a professor like me when I was young. too. <laughs> and now when I got to college, I actually had some really, really good professors. They didn't teach me anything about comics, but they taught me a lot about art. But I try to teach all my students everything that I wish I had learned when I was at that age. So I try to like compress my 30 plus years of, of professional experience into something that I teach high school students or like I teach my high school students at the college level. I teach my college students at the professional level because I'm always trying to push them forward. And essentially my job as a teacher is I want them to be better than me. I want them to get all the information it took me 30 years to get. I want to give that to them at the outset and fly from there. Very cool. And just to let you know, I've got, I mean, I've, I know I've got a few people in here, but I've got two very hungry women in here that are artists that are getting started out and everything. And Allison Warren and even at Rivas Fournier, which otherwise known as Eve, uh, both of them, I've been watching some of their work and dealing with them on some things. And you need to definitely keep an eye on them. Uh, very cool. I, I'm just telling you, they, they've got some serious talent and they've got the hunger, which is great. Uh, and in fact, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Eve, correct me if I'm wrong, but you've got your first published in a crowdfunding that's coming out in four days on Lily the Demon S number four. Excellent. So, yeah, they're, they're very hungry with that. That's why they've been asking a lot of questions, which is great because <laughs> it shows that hunger. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I want to kind of switch gears just a little bit on this one because current situations being what it is outdoors and everything, everybody knows how that is. I want to ask you, what is one of your most fond con moments that you, you know, that you remember, uh, that you, that you've had, I know you've had quite a few, I'm sure, but just something that kind of sticks out. Um, it, it's almost, I, I've heard some professionals talk about, it's like their worst con story or like their worst fan. It's like, I don't have one of those stories. And it's almost like, I also don't have the other because I have like the best fans in the on the planet. I mean, everybody who comes up to me is super. I I try to respect them. They respect me back. They you know usually they don't come to you unless they like your work in the first place. Um, I realized a long time ago that I wouldn't be anywhere if it weren't for the fans. You know, I'm doing this. Yeah, I love what I do, but I'm doing it for the readers. I'm doing it for the people who go and buy my book. So if I've done twenty three thousand pages of art. That means, you know, people have seen those pages. That's what it's all about. Um, so I get this amazing reaction constantly over and over from um, people at shows. And I love the fact that I actually have repeat customers coming to me over and over again. So I make them happy with a drawing I do or a book I work on and they follow me. They, they just like you can follow somebody on Facebook, they follow me at shows. They actually will, you know, go from show to show even sometimes. Um, I mentioned to you off camera that one of the most fulfilling things that one of the things that makes me so happy in my life is when I'm at a show with real people <laughs> uh, and I actually, somebody commissions me to do a piece of artwork, which I love doing. And I, it used to be, I only do commissions at shows because I'm so busy all the time during the shutdown, because there are no shows. I've actually, I do have a home commission list if anybody's interested. Um, but one of my favorite things is to do a piece of artwork and see the reaction when somebody picks it up. 
Now, if I, I've been so, so fortunate that I've had countless times of people just like almost crying with joy that they're like, oh, this is so much better than I expect. And that's what you want to give them that you don't want to just say, oh, yeah, I, I got my money's worth. You want to make them. I want to make them happy. And because I want to make them happy, they get, happy. you know, it, it's it's a mutual thing. They come to me because they know hopefully I'll make and then I try to make them happy. Um, one one uh, funny incident was I had a young man come up to me and he was obviously very shy. I think it was kind of like um, hiding behind his dad part of the time. But he came up to me or and mostly it was his dad was like asked for a commission for his son. So so I'm like, OK, cool. I, I love doing that. Young, young, and you can tell he's probably an art, you know, a, a learning to be artist or something, very shy and stuff. But I did this drawing for him, and then when it was done, he came and picked, and he had been kind of hanging out in the periphery, like watching me draw, which a lot of people love to do. Um, I actually enjoy that too. I, I think part of the entertainment it shows is doing the work, you know, doing the work in front of an audience. So I, I really encourage all artists draw in front of people. That's part of the entertainment factor. But anyway, so eventually this kid came and picked up the drawing. And I, I actually, t I don't remember what, I think it was like a Spider-Man, might've been even a color piece. I was really happy with it. And I'm expecting this like really good reaction, which I frequently get. And this kid doesn't make a peep. He's just, he doesn't say a word. He doesn't show anything on his face. I'm like, what did I do? Did I screw up? Did I like, did I do something wrong? And you know, I, and I could tell he was shy and stuff. So I'm like not expecting him to jump up and down or anything. No big deal. But, but he just, he just didn't even show a smile on his face. It was just like just blank face. I don't even think he really looked directly at me. It was kind of like, you know, and mumbles up like, thank you. Right. So he goes away, walks across the aisle to a group where his friends were and then he literally starts jumping up and down. And like, oh so, like, but to me, that that's such a cool story because because I I know, yeah, I did make him happy, and that's what my goal was. And it, so, it's really disappointing to me if I screw up and I don't do a good job. I've I've done times where I wasn't even happy with work, and I've just like, okay, I can't give this to somebody. I can't I can't show this. I'm going to start all over again, do a new piece. So, uh, yeah, that, but, but that's one of my con stories. Now, I will say, because I brought this up here just a little while ago, but uh, Phil Russell said that you are an awesome guest to have in a show. And he has an awesome show, too. That's exactly what I was going to bring up. If I'm not mistaken, the name of it is Creator Con. Yes. Correctly. Okay. And that is uh, in the New York area. And Philip, I, I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, but I believe it's next year that you'll be having that in the spring is what I believe you were telling me is what you were looking at anyway with the time frame. So if you're in the New York area in that time frame, go see his show. Definitely. Yeah, his, his show is very aptly named because he brings in a lot of the creator talent. So writers, pencilers, anchors, colorists. Uh, so it's a lot of it is about the art of comics. Not just, yes, there is obviously collecting comics, but he really likes to focus on the creators and we like to share with you guys. Uh, so Phil is just wonderful to work with, puts on a really nice show, and hopefully we can get back to a sane world in the not too distant future and I can see all my fans again. Absolutely. Now, lastly, I want to go ahead and bring this up because we do have some hungry people in here that, that are ready to learn and everything. So I'm going to leave this to you on this one as saying you've got some new people who want to jump into this, both feet, and get in here and just get their name out there and everything. What's the best advice you could possibly give them? Um, well, the, the amazing thing is we have the internet now, so you can get your work out there so much easier than I was young. Uh, when I was young, if you didn't get published by a publisher, you had no shot. Uh, but now you can put out your own work. You know, if it's creator, you can do crowdfunding to sponsor your own work. You can, we have the internet, you can get the stuff out there. Um, so, uh, and now some people are very shy about that. It's like, oh, it's not good enough yet or whatever. The best thing to do is get it out there, get the feedback. If people don't like it, yeah, learn from it. You know, yeah, you can't, no matter what you do, you'll never please everybody all the time because art is subjective. But the just getting your work out there, showing it to as many people as possible, that's how you get a job. You know, you have to you have to be seen. And weirdly enough, a lot of the publishers 
they don't just go to conventions and look for people. They actually go through the internet and look for people. They actually look to see, oh, wow, this person has some good stuff that's happening. Maybe we'll get in touch with them. So you never know how to work, but we have this amazing resource that you should absolutely use. And another good thing is um, deadlines are actually really important in my industry, in a lot of professional industries. So don't just post something once every two months that is a masterpiece. Show them that you can produce work on a regular basis. It doesn't have to be every day, though that would be great, but show them every couple of days. At the very least, you better be putting something up every single week because if you're not putting up new stuff, the publishers are going to say, it's like, oh, yeah, this stuff is good, but it took them two years to do that. I can't wait two years for a piece. They want to see that you can produce good work on a schedule. So if you publish it, even just on your Facebook page or your Instagram page, if you just get it out there on a regular schedule or even a semi-regular schedule, if you keep putting it out, that'll prove to people that, wow, they're, they're growing, they're getting better, and they're putting this out on a regular basis. That is some excellent advice on that. I mean, like I said, we've got some hungry people in here. I'm sure we got some more that'll be watching later on as well. And then probably some from the, you know, the shared uh, that's out there as well. So it's good to have someone in your, you know, in your position going ahead and giving that kind of advice because it makes it attainable at that point. Exactly. That All right. Well, I actually should get going pretty soon. No, I, well, <laughs> right. to get to is I could keep you on here much longer, but we're going to go ahead and start wrapping this up. So if you'll go ahead and let us know where we can find you again, I'm going to have these links on here in the feeds as well. Okay, you can find me on Instagram as hashtag Inker Scott, um, on Facebook as Scott Hanna or Scott Hanna Art. Uh, my school where I teach online classes, as well as if you're in the Pennsylvania uh, region, I we're almost getting back to where we're having real life classes again. Um, that's artsandfashioninstitute.com or AFI Art School. Um, that's uh, the easiest way. And you can also buy my original art at... Um, the uh, oh, just going blank. Uh, the artist choice .com. That's where you can buy a lot of my originals from my law career in comics. Very cool. Yeah, you've you've got a lot of stuff that's available and everything. Because I was kind of looking at that beforehand, and it is some amazing work. So if you have a chance to go look at that and, and get some of that stuff, it is it's great stuff. It's well worth it. Thank you. But thank you for being here very much. I appreciate you being on here, and you've been a great guest. And I know that they've had a, uh, I, you know, they've I absolutely enjoyed having you on here tonight because we've had a lot of comments in here. <laughs> but uh, let me go ahead. I'll do my closing statement, and I will see you in the green room here shortly. Excellent. Take care. Thank you.